Okay. So, my name is Justice Robertson. On behalf of myself and Michael Young and the Liquid Narrative Group here at North Carolina State, I'd like to present gameplay as online mediation search. So what I'm going to be talking about is uh, using a drama manager as a game engine. So having gameplay uh, arise out of an AI representation that can update based on actions that a player uh, takes while playing the game. Uh, so I'm going to start with the introduction, talk about existing mediation systems, talk about mediation game trees, which is uh, kind of a tweak on the existing system, and talk about uh, the implementation of these mediation game trees called the general mediation engine. Uh, so this is an interactive narrative system. So you can kind of think of interactive narratives as branching stories with events that change based on feedback from participants. So some existing uh, interactive narratives may be like choose your own adventures, um, text adventures like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and also some modern games like Mass Effect all have stories that change based on uh, actions that a player can take while playing the game. So here's a page from The Cave of Time, which was the first Choose Your Own Adventure book. You can kind of see that some events happen on the page that the player doesn't have any control over. And then at the bottom of the page, they can choose to either take one option or take another. And based on their choice, they uh, turn to the corresponding page. So if they pay, turn to page 74, unfortunately, they get eaten by the Loch Ness Monster, which is, is not great. Uh, over the years, about 10 years ago, uh, people started visualizing these Choose Your Own Adventures. One of the first people to do this was Andrew Stern in 2003 on the blog Grand Text Auto, uh, made this map of a Choose Your Own Adventure. You can kind of see the nodes have uh, page numbers, so you, you can think of these events that happen on the page as the nodes, and then the edges are choices that the player gets to make after reading the page events. So here's one for uh, Cave of Time, what we just saw, and over here is the the Nessie option, I think, right there. So unfortunately, 74 leads to a bad ending, but the other option would have led to two good endings, so it's unfortunate for our player. And here's one more, and all of them have nodes that have page numbers, which are these events that the player has no control over, and edges that are choices the player gets to make. So you can kind of think of this as a story graph, uh, where once again, the nodes are actions that are taken by NPCs, or that the player is taken automatically, and then the edges are decisions the player gets to make. And when the player plays through this, they kind of start at the initial state, get to make a decision, say D1, they move to a intermediate state, make another decision, and once they hit a node with no outgoing edges, they kind of reach the end of their story. You can kind of think of this as a linear story that plays out as kind of a discourse between the uh, pre-scripted events and the actions the player chooses. So it boils down to a linear story that plays out. So it's really cool to have players choose uh, the way that a uh, story progresses, but the unfortunate bit is that the more unique choices you give to a player, the more uh, stories that happen. So even giving three choice options per choice and three options deep, you're already at 27 uh, different stories. And it's tough for a human author to write one story, much less 27 different unique ones. So that's where kind of AI systems come in. The idea with uh, interactive narrative systems is to design a general purpose set of rules where then a human author could set, set up uh, some general requirements for what they want their story to play out like and it will automatically create a branching story graph. So now I'm going to talk about mediation. So mediation is a plan-based approach to interactive narrative generation and there have been quite a few systems uh, made uh, that implemented mediation starting with Mimesis and these last two passed and Schrodinger Mediation are both, I believe, papers here at AID. So PAST is um, uh, Ramirez and Balitko, and I think they have a demo paper here at AID. And Schrodinger Mediation is myself and Michael Young, and we have a poster paper here at AID. So check, check us out and check, check us out and see what those are like. Anyway, they all kind of act like this. They start with a planner that takes as input a planning problem and produces a plan, which is a series of actions that transforms an initial state to a goal state. And here's a really simplified planning problem that's uh, made readable. Usually this would be uh, all logic, um, but it's based on a King Arthur domain. So we have a domain of action templates and a problem that consists of an initial state and a goal state. And in our particular initial state, which is the way the story world kind of starts out, we have uh, Arthur, who's a player. Arthur's at a place called The Woods. Uh, there's another character called Merlin, who's at a place called The Clearing. Uh, Merlin is asleep. 
Merlin has a spell book called Merlin Book. There's a spell book, a second spell book at the woods. Uh, there's a ring at the woods. There's a sword named Excalibur at the clearing. Excalibur is enchanted, and the woods and the clearing are connected. And we also have a goal state of, uh, at the end of our story, we want Arthur to have Excalibur. Uh, and then our action templates define things that characters can do in the story world. So we have a character can move from one place to another if they're, uh, if they're connected. Uh, players can take something if they're at the same place as it and it's not enchanted. Um, players can wake a character up if they're asleep and they're at the same place. And players can also disenchant an object if they have a spell book and they're at the same location as the object. So a plan is a, um, is a solution to a planning problem. And one solution to this planning problem was something like this. Um, Arthur takes the spell book at the woods moves from the woods to the clearing, disenchants Excalibur with the spell book he picked up at the woods, and takes Excalibur. But that's just a, a linear story. So mediation's job is to take the linear story and create a branching story structure. So it takes his input, a plan, and creates a branching mediation tree. So I'm going to jump back to story graphs real quick. Remember, we have a traversal through a story graph can be thought of as a linearization. So it's one way the events could play out. Uh, you could also take a, a second, a second uh, path through the story graph, and we can represent this in the linearization representation by having a, a edge come out of the last uh, event that takes place in the initial node, and that be the second choice. And then a second linearization could play out from that point. And that's basically what a mediation tree is. It's, uh, the initial node is the first plan, which is the first linearization that the system wants to play out. And then it analyzes that for every uh, choice or deviation that the player can make at that point, creates an edge, and has a new linearization that could play out from this new state that the player creates. So in the context of the Arthur example, we have uh, our initial plan. But if the player, instead of taking the spell book at the woods, moved first to the clearing, they can no longer disenchant Excalibur. So this breaks our initial plan. The initial plan can no longer play out. So what we do is query the planner from this point and ask for a new planner. And one possible one is for the player to wake Merlin up at the clearing, have Merlin disenchant Excalibur for them, and then pick up Excalibur, and that achieves our goal state. In the context of me a mediation tree, we have our initial uh, plan up in the first node. That's what would uh, control uh, interaction at the start. And then if it sensed that the player uh, moved to the clearing from that initial node, it would transfer um, control down to this other plan that it would want to play out from that point forward. So to have this actually work in a, in a game, we would need a client PC, uh, a game, something like Unreal uh, or Unity or something like that running on the PC. We would need mediation, uh, the mediation tree that's been generated by, by an AI system. And in the middle, we need something called an experience manager, which would sense player actions over in the, in the game engine and also affect things when, uh, based on what's going on in the mediation tree. And you can kind of think of the experience manager as this robot and the game engine as an environment that's external to it. So it can sense things in the environment and it can also affect things in the environment. And it, it does this based on its internal model of uh, what's going on in the game world. But the difference between a physical world and the game world is that uh, the game world isn't external, or doesn't have to be external to our AI system. So we can move the game representation up and have it come directly from the, the experience manager's internal representation. And so that's what we've done here with a few tweaks. We've added a few things into a uh, mediation tree and created something I call a mediation game tree. And with that, uh, that coupled with something called a discourse generator, which is just a way of presenting what's going on in the AI representation to the player, we can have gameplay arise directly from the AI representation. So I'm going to talk about the little differences between mediation trees and mediation game trees. So before our nodes were plans, but now our nodes are states. And we call the plan uh, a narrative trajectory. And it's been called that before. But it's, it's kind of a way that we want the story to play out. But now our nodes are actual states of the world, which we didn't track before. And we're also tracking everything the player can do. Before, we'd only track uh, their breaking actions, like them moving to the clearing, things that would break our initial plan. And also, implicitly, things like them taking the spell book, which is part of our initial plan. But now we're also tracking things like them taking the ring, which doesn't break the initial plan, 
but it also doesn't further it in any way. It's just things they can do. We're, we're, since we're tracking states now, we need to track these other just actions that could happen. And uh, this is called the player layer. So what we would do is present uh, the things that the player could observe of the state and allow them to take one of these uh, enabled actions. And for each type of action, there's a different type of system update that happens after we sense that the player has, done, has taken the action. So for example, if they take something that we want to happen, something that's in the plan, we update the spellbook, I mean, we update the state, so they ha now have the spellbook, for example. And we also update the trajectory, we pop off the action that they just took from our uh, desired series of events. If they do something that's not that doesn't break our trajectory, but also uh, doesn't further it in any way. We just update, update the state, and we don't mess with the trajectory at all. And the third thing is, if they actually take one of these breaking actions, we both update the state and also ask for a new plan from the current state to the, to the original goal state. So in this case, this functions just like the original mediation tree. And a third thing that we would do here is, if any available NPC action could take place, for example, if uh, Arthur had woke Merlin, we could pop that off too and allow the NPC to take action and update the state based on the uh, NPC action as well. Uh, so I'm going to go through uh, and show you an implementation of these ideas called the General Mediation Engine. Um, here's an example input. This is a domain. So this is the PDDL of the, of the um, well actually this is the problem. So this is the PDDL that specifies the initial and goal state. So you can see it's very similar to the uh, written out example I gave earlier. We have things like player Arthur, character Arthur, Arthur's at the woods. And uh, Arthur having Excalibur is the goal state that down there at the bottom. And then we have our four actions, which are specified in PDDL as well. So like this is the move location action. So uh, character, the mover has to be a character. The mover has to be the, at the old location and not at the new location. They can't be asleep. So things like that have to be true in the world for it to happen. And then an effect of this happening is they're no longer at the old location, but they're at the new location. So we have four of these. They're all kind of similar. And that's all the input to the system, just that domain, just those four domain action templates and the, um, the problem file. And I've created a simple like text-based game to, to allow the user to navigate uh, the, the mediation game tree. So you can do things like type in look, and it'll say, It'll use uh, observation axioms, which right now it's basically like if you're at a place and something else is at the place, then you see it, so it gets printed off to the screen. So if you're standing in the woods, you see a spell book, the spell book is a book, you see a ring, you see a door leading to the clearing, and it's also in debug mode, so it prints off the thing that it wants to happen, which at this point is just, it wants Arthur to move to the clearing, wake Merlin, which was the, the inverse of my example, but for some reason this is what the planner wants to happen is. Once uh, Arthur to move the clearing, wake Merlin, disenchant Excalibur, and take Excalibur. So you can type in actions that correspond to your enabled player actions at this point. So you can take the spell book, and up there at the top, it will tell you what happened in the world after you took the action. So the spell book is no longer at the woods, and now Arthur has the spell book. You can also see it update in the state. So now you no longer see the spell book in the, in the state that gets printed out. And that was a, con uh, a consistent action, so it didn't break the plan but it also didn't further it, so nothing about our trajectory has changed. Uh, so if we move to the clearing, this is something that the system wants to happen, so it pops that off of the top of the narrative trajectory. You can see that we're now standing in the clearing, so a new set of, of items gets printed out at the player. So you see Merlin, you see Merlin's asleep, Merlin has a book, you see Excalibur, it's a sword and it's enchanted, and you see a door leading back to the woods. So now we're going to disenchant Excalibur instead of waking uh, Merlin up and asking him to do it for us. And at this point, um, you now see Excalibur is just a sword. It's no longer enchanted. And also, the narrative trajectory has updated since you've taken an exceptional action. You've taken something that it didn't want to happen because it wanted Merlin to disenchant the book. And now that you've done it, Merlin can no longer do it. So it comes up with a new plan, which is you just taking Excalibur from this point, which uh, accomplishes the goal state. So in conclusion, um, mediation trees uh, are nice if you have an existing game that you want to control interaction in, and they're nice because they have a, a smaller search space because we don't track states, we don't track these updates or anything like that. As long as you can model the existing game world with a mediation tree, you can use it with an experience manager to control interaction in, a, in an existing game. 
But the nice thing about mediation game trees is there's a one-to-one -one, uh, match between the game and the AI representation. So you could simulate Ford in the mediation game tree and know that's exactly what's going to happen in the game world if the player takes the set of actions that you simulated Ford with. It also has a high-level world construction, so if you just create a new uh, domain and problem file and push that in, you'll get a new game experience based on, you'll still follow the, the rules of taking actions that are enabled by the system, but you'll get a new game world. Um, and also, I didn't mention this before, but it's the story generator is modular, so you can use this with any planner that takes this input PDDL file and produces a plan. Right now, I'm using Fast Downward, which is just an off-the-shelf state space planner. So here's uh, the web page where I got the Choose Your Own Adventure visualizations from the, from the start, and that's the end. Great, Luke. Thanks for speaking. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. So one of the original ideas of mediation is that some paths were more preferred than others. You still have that um, property here as well? Yeah, the paths that are prefer preferred are just the ones that get to the goal state, but it doesn't take any, at the moment, it doesn't take any active, um, it, any active, it doesn't take any action to push you towards those. It lets you go wherever you want, and then it just responds to the best of its ability. Um, so yeah, the preferred ones are still the ones that get to the goal state, um, but it, it doesn't try to get you there any better than just letting you go wild and trying to accommodate your actions. So it does operate more like a open-ended game engine, more of a... Open-ended game engine that uses a planner to both um, determine how to update the states and what the player can do, and also uses a planner to determine NPC actions. Hmm. Yes? It, it seems like this is a really, a really clean solution when all the mechanics of the game world fit. Com like, they are nice to express in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have some, like, I don't know, physics component or something like that, can you imagine how you plug in, like, yeah, so one thing I've been experimenting with actually is um, instead of using a text-based visualization, which lends itself very well to this PDDL stuff because everything is discrete, mm -hmm. plugging it into a 2D game. And that's a little bit tougher, but the kind of my hack to work around it so far has been just a, a kind of define game mechanic -y type stuff. So I've been building a Legend of Zelda type game. So you can move around, but since we have like, it's the NES type Zelda, so you have like this view of the current room. You can move around in the room without affecting the underlying tree or at all. But then I have general mechanics set up, so like if you go and hit a certain button at an item, <laughs> then it triggers the PDDL um, action statement for picking up the item, and that transitions the, the game tree, which updates the state, which updates the visualization. Mm -hmm. So right now, I there's a hack you can kind of do by defining the game mechanics over here and then having that kind of layered on top, but that's kind of similar to what I'm doing with the, the text stuff anyway, because I'm um, taking from that representation and spitting it out. It's just a lot easier to do it because it's more discrete. Uh, yes? At which moment does it break? So at which moment do you have like too many actions, too many things that could happen, and they can keep up with the player's uh, choices? Um, that's a good question. I haven't tried pushing it to its limit yet. Um, it's online, so you can try to come up with your own PDL like uh, domain and problem file and see what you can do to try and get it to break. Um, What's your opinion? What do you think? It's that's that's a good question, and I I think that would be an interesting question moving forward to see how well it scales up to something larger. The biggest thing I've done right now is put it into Unity and do this okay. 2D game type stuff, which is still relatively simple domain and problem files. I think I have a, uh, a domain file that's got um, 20, 15 or 20 action templates, but nothing much more than that I've tried to throw at it. Okay. Uh, and I also do some stuff like while you're waiting, it's waiting for you to do a s decision, it like, it, um, it goes ahead and open, like explores the um, the next available actions and goes ahead and like replans and yeah. caches that stuff to try and okay. minimize load time. That type of thing. Okay. I think Ian's been wait. Um, this would be too hard to be worthwhile, but um, sort of the dream version of this, it seems like, would be to integrate it into something like Inform Seven. 
thought about like what would be a version of a you know an interactive fiction authoring system that this would fit in cleanly with? So that was my original thought. Actually, the way this came about was I wanted to make a system that wasn't tied that would could be used by any planner and. Um, Doing that, I had to track the state variable, the state stuff. I had to track every action. And I kind of, one, before I was just printing out a bunch of HTML files where you could kind of click through and see the new action, but I wanted an online way to explore the space. And I was going to hook it into something like Inform7, but I couldn't find a interactive fiction system that had nice hooks for my AI. So, and then it just kind of dawned on me, well, if I just wrote a thing that I could t navigate the space Online, that's basically, you know, a game. That's exactly what I have. Um, so last night we were talking, and I said Rogelio and Camila and I have been kicking around this idea of like a Inform Seven style um, PDDL like uh, interpreter, and I think that would be the really powerful thing is have some type of IDE that made it really easy for authors to type in and build worlds, and then it would automatically uh, create the PDDL files for them. So at the moment, uh, all of your NPC actions are kind of optimally helpful, uh, assuming you're following the same plan that the system is. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you talk a little bit about how you'd expand this to incorporate notions of appropriate challenge or interestingness or engagement? Oh, sure. Um, so one thing I haven't explored yet, because I just made this and created a few domains, is like, is this actually fun for people to do? Um, if you want to like gamify it, one thing I've been kicking around, like ASD, one of uh, Mark's systems, has like a tiered replanning strategy, and he has a set of goal states that uh, that are possible good things for the for the, the author would want. So if you get to the end and can't replan from the current place, it would go to another uh, goal state in this in this set of goal states that the author's defined. I can imagine like setting up maybe a utility with a set of goal states, so that like you start off by trying to plan to like the best. Um, goal state from the, from the user's perspective, and if they kind of make that unavailable, then you would drop down, and you keep dropping down until you reach like the most unoperable, and that might like take the system and try and fit it in with maybe more existing game structures, where there's some challenge involved to trying to get to the best ending. Yeah? Just to follow up on that, um, best done word is a uh, version of heuristic search space, so you don't have a lot of control over the heuristic, it auto-generates it which means it will drive to the goal as fast as it can. But what I found is very useful is uh, if you know in advance there are intermediate states, like, um, oh, I really want to antagonize the player. Uh, I want him to be eaten by a dragon or attacked by a dragon. You can put those into the problem and say, well, all solutions have to go through this antagonizing state before going proceeding to the goal. Uh, didn't Kavaza and um, Porteus have a paper that was talking about using state constraints to inform Yes, yes, my paper in in <laughs> preceded them by a couple months. Oh. <laughs> 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 Small plug. <laughs> See me after. <laughs> oh yeah. All right, let's let's jump ahead and, and, and try to drop this into a, a some sort of triple A game. And how would you see the system accommodating? in a triple A game, the system accommodating <coughs> the actions of the player, assuming that we're just gonna have some sort of, you know, a mono goal at the end that you win the game, but you know, let the player succeed or fail or do it in a variety of different ways. Um, are you going to be using the results of potential plans for a given state space to inform NPCs of hey I need you to actually come over here and be with the player so that he could use you for this. I need to generate an item in this. Yeah. How would you do it without just, you know, a lot of magic wand stuff of, oh, and then you enter this room and look, you've discovered this, which you re really, really want you to use. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is, can you seamlessly, can you imagine a way of seamlessly putting it into a, an open world type of game so that it is just gently leading the player along by affecting, without completely, you know, uh, destroying the the uh, immersion of, and then this guy magically teleports to the room you're in. Yeah, so uh, as Mark was saying earlier, like, um, he asked whether, like, there were certain guided paths, and I said, like, sure, right yeah. now, 
I kind of let them do whatever they want. So it's kind of like an open-ended game. It's just that the NPCs will react according to what the planner desires. And the planner is a black box right now, so you could swap in any type of system that solves planning problems and does sure. it different ways. So if you wanted, um, if you want, if you weren't happy with a certain story experience, then maybe you could plug in a different planner that would different generate different types of plans. The other thing uh, is. Uh, one thing I'm working on is um, changing the world, but always making sure that the way I change it, I'm not just randomly teleporting people around, but I'm tr keeping track of what the player has seen and intelligently moving things around that's in the best interest of the system, but is all the way also always consistent with what the player has seen. And that Schrodinger mediation thing that I, mm -hmm. that I mentioned that's a poster paper is actually what that's... And, and I think that that's probably where I was elegantly, was that how do you try to continue to accommodate the player without, you know, but you're almost having to do a planner for what you want the player to do, but then a planner also for how to get to the state that we want to be in for the player, you know, so that he can get to his state, yeah, so it, it is a multi-tiered thing, and that's what I was wondering if you had any insight on that, so yeah. The ideal would be the player can do whatever they want, but still somehow the, the system kind of gets is able to guide them down a place where it feels seamless to them, but it may not necessarily be um, that open-ended on the background. I think it's all going to go together because your planner is going to say, oh, this is, I think, the best path, however, decides that, and I need to have this NPC here because there's going to be a handoff, whatever right. your yeah. temple is. But the planner is just going to decide, well, if I think the player is going to go this way, then I need to start moving things in here. If you don't have a temporal notion, you might want to extend the planner that's one thing, there, yeah, but. that's one, and that's mm -hmm. something I can do with this structure since I know the things that have played out and I know exactly what the player has done. I can maybe pull pieces of the right. MP, unobserved NPC actions that have happened in the past, rearrange them, and fit them back in. So it's almost like you need a, a planner to solve the future uh, state space nodes in the plan that you're doing for the player. That's so it's like you're, you're trying to assemble these states that are out there in the future. And that's what it's doing, it's trying to predict yeah. the future and put everything in place, and if the user decides for something else, well, then there's a new future right. that gets yeah. generated. And it's, a, it's an interesting system. approach, yeah. Actually, isn't, wouldn't like an um, alpha beta search would be more appropriate? Like, uh, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to find, to, to prevent the player from breaking me completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so, so that's so one thing. Oh, then sorry. I, I, then I can, because the player is unable to avoid like brittle states when the player can easily break your whole game. So it doesn't do anything like that right now. And that was actually, I, I was in a, um, a piece of the, um, I forget, the, the antagonistic RTS workshop yesterday. And it kind of dawned on me that that might be interesting as a look at some of the, the RTS like game tree search techniques and try to simulate forward, try to predict what the player is going to do based on some model, and then try to steer them away from that. But it doesn't do anything like that right now. It just lets the player do whatever they want. Um, this is going to be our last question. OK. Jill? Have you tried um, designing this with more than one goal state? <coughs> no, uh, I haven't. And um, Mark had, did that for ASD, where it would move through a set of goals. But yeah, that's something that could happen is have a, a set of author defined goals and it move through that intelligently in some way. I mean, because the model you have where you're, you, you have like a tree, you know, it's, you know with the linearization seems like an array, but it's almost like the, the population of the, and repopulation of the heap. You know, you, you're, you have a, a root and then that's like the goal, or the reverse, that's sort of the place where you're at and one of the goals is in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And you kind of move through it and then just sort of shifts, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were to think about possible you know, rearrangements every time there's multiple goal states. It could also be a different one. Yeah, yeah. Repopulate the array, repopulate the heat, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Well, great, thanks, Justin. Thanks.